It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the four films of May 12, 2006. And we are in the beginning of the summer movie season, and we do have one big blockbuster, and then a couple, and then one sort of blockbuster ish, mostly counter programming film with Lindsay Lohan, and then a couple of smaller movies in general. But uh, before we get to those films, of course, let's get to the biggest new release of the weekend, which was, of course, Wolfgang Peterson's remake of the classic film, The Poseidon Adventure, simply known as Poseidon. So the plot really does kind of just go through the same storyline as the other movies have. And the, and the book this is based off of, of course, on New Year's Eve, the luxury ocean line of Poseidon capsizes after being swamped by a rogue wave. The survivors are left to fight for their lives as they attempt to escape the sinking ship. And you see in that, in that trail there, a pretty stacked cast overall. Kurt Russell, Richard Dreyfuss, Josh Lucas, Andre Brower, Emmy Rossum, uh, Fergie from the Black Eyed Peas is also in here, Jacinda Barrett. There is a lot of really notable names in here, and unfortunately the movie was not the big hit that I think the studio really wanted. In fact, it actually flopped pretty badly. And I say and I say unfortunately because I didn't think the movie was all that bad. In fact, there was a lot of times in the film where there was a lot that I really did appreciate about it. The visual spectral of the whole movie is incredible. Like the like the ship going the ship getting attacked by the wave. It's actually really well done, and the visuals really are impressive to look at. But as I've always said, visuals don't make the movie. You gotta have good characters, you gotta have a good storyline, and unfortunately, the rest of the movie isn't that compelling whatsoever because the characters aren't really all that memorable in general. They're just kind of just stock generic characters, you know? You got the, you got the characters that we've seen so many times in other disaster movies like this, and unfortunately, there's no real good writing here to really give these characters a boost overall in terms of, like... Like give us a, give us a reason why we should be putting them on to get out of here, and there's just there's just nothing there, unfortunately. And it's a shame because there is a lot to admire about the film from the technical level, and you know it just it takes what was a pretty good 1970s movie, which was nominated for several Oscars too, by the way. This was back when the Academy Awards actually cared about all the movies that came out and didn't just shove the blockbusters aside for the smaller movies. No, this was back when. They gave a shit about movies like movies like the original Poseidon Adventure, which would have never gotten nominated. If it was made today for Best Picture, not by any means necessary. It was actually nominated for several war big awards back then, but that movie worked because there were characters in there that you did get invested in. There was a lot of ambition and a lot of storyline that the audience got invested into, and unfortunately, the ambition is there. Just everything else really isn't. It's a shame because there is a lot that I liked about it, but. It's not enough for me to say that it's something that you should give it a watch overall. It's just, it's just not a very good movie overall, unfortunately, and it's just, it's a shame. It's a shame because there is so much there to admire about the film in general from the visual spectrum, but unfortunately everything else from the casting that's really good, but unfortunately not given a lot to work with with the characters in general and the storyline, it's just, it's unfortunate. It's an unfortunate mess of a film, and uh, yeah, not much more I can say about this one, unfortunately. A major disappointment, but... Stuff I liked about it to say that it's on the cusp of saying it's watchable just for the special effects, but even then, it's not worth it for me to say. You should definitely check it out, unfortunately. Yeah. So, a mixed opinion, mostly a mixed opinion on Poseidon. So, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next movie. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the movie that killed Lindsay Lohan's movie career. I know you think it's Georgia Rule. I know you think it's I Know Who Killed Me, but they contributed it. But no, this was the first movie that really broke the trend. Yeah, this movie really was the one that killed it. I mean, you know, Herbie Fully Loaded was not a big hit the, the year before compared to Mean Girls and, you know, Freaky Friday from Lindsay beforehand, but that was still a hit that people went to go see. Nobody went to go see this, and this unfortunately started a downward trend for Lindsay Lohan that took a while for her to get back to. And she stars in this movie as Ashley Albright, who works in public relations and is the luckiest person in Manhattan, when Jane Harden, played by Chris Pine, is a janitor and would-be music producer who seems to have terrible luck until their good and bad luck is switched upon kissing each other in a masquerade ball, which changes both their lives and leads them to meet each other once again. A concept that could be funny if it was given the right material to work with to actually make us really appreciate the characters overall, but you really do not like any of these people in this movie whatsoever. Lindsay Lohan just comes off as a stock character. Like they throw, is Chris Pine 
is trying his best to hold it together, but this was still back when they were still really tr struggling to find a, an identity for him as an actor in general, but he's still got a couple of years before we eventually know him as what he'll eventually become better known for as Captain Kirk in the Star Trek movies, but this is directed by Donald Petrie, too, and Donald Petrie's made some movies I've liked. I've liked, is I liked Richie Rich. I liked, um, I like Miss Congeniality, uh, there's, but then again, he's directed a lot of stuff I have not liked. He directed The Grump, Grumpy Old Men, which is one I really liked, but then he did stuff like Welcome to Mooseport, and How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days, and My Favorite Martian, and yeah, he's a mixed bag of a director overall, and unfortunately, the film itself, just that trailer alone, I had to cut it off because you could kind of tell what kind of a movie this is. This is a film that is just... It's just stu it's just a, a blown up big screen pilot for a TV series. Like this would be something that would be seen as the a as a new ABC series to follow, you know, Modern Family or Abbott Elementary or CB or even on CBS. You know, be part of that Monday lineup probably after How I Met Your Mother, sandwich between How I Met Your Mother and Everybody Loves Raymond, or at this point Two and a Half Men. But yeah, it's just not a good movie. You don't like the characters whatsoever. You don't like the storyline. They're just stock characters. Their relationship isn't that believable. The chemistry just isn't working. And it's just not funny. It's just not an enjoyable movie by any means necessary. It's a lazy film. A much better talent, I think, could have been put to this be just a better use and make it a fun, high-energy high energy comedy. An ambitious comedy, if you will. Like a, bit, a more bigger budget of comedy in general. But unfortunately, it's just not there in this movie. And it's just not a good film whatsoever. So yeah, a hard skip on Just My Luck. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next movie. Let's get to some good movies finally. Uh, here's one that I saw that did not that did not think I was going to like, but that came out of nowhere. Uh, Gold, The Dream Begins. Who would have guessed this would turn into a franchise? They actually have made some sequels to this movie. Uh, there's actually a trilogy out there. And in this movie, you have uh, Santiago Munez, played by Kuno Becker, who's an amateur soccer player who earns an unlikely chance to play professional football or soccer, if you want to put it that way. And it's one that really came out of nowhere. It's a film that I remember hearing about, I remember seeing in the stores, and I just never really took the time to watch it. It w did eventually become later on Disney+, Plus and then Hulu, and I figured... Eh, there's nothing else on there. I might as well go check it out. And I was kind of surprised at how much I enjoyed. This is directed by Danny Cannon, who the last time I think he directed a film in theaters, it was Judge Dredd, if I'm not mistaken. I could be very wrong on that, but but then again, I am. Yes, I am wrong. But the last thing he directed though was not any better. I still know what you did last summer. This is actually the last film he ever directed. I think he went back mostly to television. But I think what makes it work is the script by Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenaise, who have written some stuff I've actually really liked in the past. Um, uh, they wrote um, Flushed Away, which is a really good DreamWorks film, Armin film we'll get to later on in the year. Across the Universe, which is a criminally underrated m musical with the songs of the Beatles. Uh, he also wrote Never Say Never Again with James Bond involved. This with uh, James, Sean Connery as James Bond. Vice Versa, one of the few body switch comedies with Fred Savage and Judge Reinhold that actually worked back in the 1980s. This is a, is they put, put their hands on this. It's a really, really enjoyable film. It's an encouraging uh, story where you want to follow this guy all the way to, you know, becoming the soccer star that you eventually become in this film. And it's a very intriguing and very entertaining film that I think works because you like the main characters a lot. You like their motivations. You want to see where they're going to go in life. And it's a very good, inv inspiring story overall. Even if you're not the biggest soccer person, like I'm not a soccer person in general, but. I did get easily invested in the storyline pretty quickly, and I will say that, yeah, it's indeed definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. I, I highly recommend checking it out, Gold of Dream Begins. I haven't seen the sequel yet, but I'll probably get to it at some point. But um, but the first one I really like, Gold of Dream Begins. So with that said, let's go ahead and move on to our last movie, and probably the most over underrated film I saw, I saw this in, that, came out this that came out on this weekend, Keeping Up with the Steins. This is a movie I actually really kind of enjoy. This is a commentary about how too many Jewish families see a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah not as a coming of age for their son or daughter, but rather as an excuse to throw outlandish, outrageously lavish parties which end in drama. So, essentially, the the Jewish the bar mitzvah version of My Super Sweet Sixteen. I mean, that's what literally every episode of My Super Sweet Sixteen was. You know, not celebrating the sixteenth birthday of your teenager of your teenage daughter, but no, let's throw the most exuberant, loud, over the top party. And I think that's the idea of this particular film in general. And that, for that, I kind of have to admire it for that. 
This is a really good movie. It's got a really good cast. You know, Gary Marshall direct, is, in, is in this. His son directed this movie, Scott Marshall. Jeremy Piven, Jamie Gertz, Daryl Sabero from Spy Kids, Larry Miller, Cheryl Hines, uh, Daryl Hannah. A really, really top-tier cast. And a really overall entertaining film all around. I was actually really surprised at how much I enjoyed this movie. It, it has kind of a similar problems to Just My Luck. But unlike Just My Luck, which was written so, which was written just like a sitcom, this is also written like a sitcom, except you do get invested in the storyline and the characters as well. And that's what I really took from this movie in general, how much I really appreciated this film. I thought it was very funny. I thought it was a sweet story. I thought it was a nicely put together film. It was a film that really did come out of nowhere. I just remember seeing it with Giant Eagle when I, when I was, uh, when the video store was still there. And, and I figured I'll write it one night. And I actually found myself really enjoying it. I thought it was a very entertaining film. Very underrated film. I highly recommend checking it out. Keeping up with the signs. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and the next time we meet, we've got three more big summer releases, including Tom Hanks starring in the controversial uh, feature film adaptation of the controversial book, The Da Vinci Code, directed by Ron Howard, of course, and we also have DreamWorks' latest animated feature, Over the Hedge, based off the comic strips, and starring Bruce Willis, Gary Shanling, and Steve Carell among its voice cast, and we also have See No Evil starring Kane from the WWE. This is actually, I think, one of the first WWE films under that label they had out around this time. But uh, we'll take a look at those three movies on the next episode. That'll be up tomorrow. But until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please like this video, hit the subscribe button, and check out the notification button because we post videos every day here. Check out the plays on the next page as well as the previous episode. So uh, with all that said, before I get out of here, I should tell you that coming up later on time about the movie's flashback, we're flashing back to Halloween weekend 1987, which is fitting because Halloween was literally yesterday at the time of recording this. But um, Fatal Beauty, we'll talk about The Hidden, and also Sammy and Rosie got, Get Laid. So three movies, not as many as we've had in the last couple of episodes, but that'll be coming up in a little bit. So stay tuned, because we will be right back with that after this.